we're just streaming to their own channel. Oh, okay. But, but Howard seems to... There. Howard's your standalone star? Yeah. It's my only show. Howard, the guy who sees me at Ralph's and doesn't acknowledge me, doesn't talk to me. That's Howard, though. He, what, is always deliciously socially awkward and happy to keep people in a discomfort zone? Is that his gig? Like Bobcat Goldthwait? Is that what that is? Jeez, uh, I think you're lying. Explain further to me what it takes for people to be congenial and amiable with each other. Explain this to me. Explain this to me. What's going on? Hello, sir. Hey, Don Murphy. How you doing? Boom. X, S, M in the house. That's me. How you doing, Mr. Murphy? Good, brother. How are you? Super good. Look at this. Look at all these fascinating books. Some Tolkien, some not. What do we have here? Well, the camera's not pointing at our books, so we can't really. I can zoom out. We can zoom out. Just a little bit. Well, you can hold them up. Sure I can. Sure I can, and I will. Say hello, Gracie. Hello, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. <laughs> hey, are we all? We're we live. We gotta be live. This must be. This must be the place. This must be the place where you are all watching the Torn Tuesday, and which I will be speaking under strange accents and dialects all through the show that make no sense. But I will be doing it. Maybe I've been watching too much Jeffrey Rush, playing Albert Einstein. Got my fake German accent on today. I tried getting into that show. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I'm just you know making a joke reference. But I really have not seen Genius, a Nat Geographic. It's got Jeffrey Rush, who steals the show as Barbosa. I mean, I know you guys are here to talk about The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Welcome to Torn Tuesday. Hello, everyone. There's Irovandi, Marfels, Mayor Gamgee. Happy Tuesday slash Wednesday, because certainly one half of the planet has already moved past the midnight hour. <laughs> and they've already hit Wednesday morning. And we're so grateful for those friends in Europe, in Africa, uh, in Asia, and uh, of course in Australasia, in the New Zealand, Australia, Southern Hemisphere zone. Everybody, we're so happy to have our, our friends come and watch us Torn Tuesday on a Torn Wednesday. I'm sure you guys get plenty of laughs about that. But how about that? Here we are, doing a live show. We are live. Look, all the people are joining us live. Hey guys, check this out. Look at what I've got here. We have The Hobbit from Eclipse Books. That's right, one of the only comic book adaptations of The Hobbit. Welcome to our live show. Hey, hey, how you doing? Who is this? This is Clifford. Welcome. I'm really glad to have you guys here. My name is Clifford, also known as Clifford the Big Red Dog. <laughs> Sometimes they just call me Quick Beam. I'm one of the uh, editors and writers uh, and the show host for the OneRing.net, and you are watching Torn Tuesday. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Hey, Hobbit fans on Instagram. Hello, Facebook Live, Ustream Live. We're on YouTube Live. We're on Twitter Live. My goodness, we're on Instagram. Hello, Instagram. Welcome, everybody, to Torn Tuesday. Which is our playful acronym, acronym, I didn't say that right, did I? <laughs> no, I mean our playful acronym, that's what I meant to freaking say, the acronym for the one ring dot net with a little lowercase t-o-r-n, you guys got that? T-o-r-n, the one ring dot net, just so that you guys are no longer confused by where you are or what you are watching. Welcome to the show. We have a lot of surprises in store for you. Um, we have a special guest, maybe, I don't know. There may be a special guest. It's like that moment in the Dark Crystal when uh, Jen is captured by the tendrils and the vines and Agra says to him, you know, Nia Gelfling, reach. And she talks to him and, and he doesn't respond. Hi, Car <laughs> how you doing, Caroline? Tiffany, there's Tiffany. And Agra says, Are you a girlfling? And Jen, so nervous, and he's totally freaking out. He's like, Yes. Oh, yeah, and he's totally freaking out. He's totally freaking out. 
and the joke comes up where he says, uh, my master sent me, wisest of the mystics. And she goes, where is he? Around here? And she looks around and Jen says, he's dead. And she, she just does a throwaway line and she says, could be anywhere then. I wasn't gonna come on the show. Could be anywhere but then. But Tiffany's here. Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany. N N Navi Broadway. Does she like Avatar? Because that's what her middle name looks like, Anavi. Tiffany. I don't know if she means Navea. I think that's like. I want to go to I the think Avatar she's doing the, Land at, the Di Shanti, at Shanti, World. Shanti, Shanti. Like you know. I want to pretend that Hindu she thing. likes to be play cosplays blue people. She looks like you. <laughs> you could cosplay as a Navi. You're tall, you're thin. I predict that all, yes. I, my, my yes, mental sorry. image is everyone in your family looks like a Navi. They're, no. they're well spoken, no. they're environmentally act, uh, 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 aware. You don't know uh, my family. You know, they, they often say that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, but this one did. This one apple fell very far from that tree. So, hello, yeah, Kaylin Griffin. Yeah, and ended up on the other side. Hey, guess what? I ended up on the other side of the I farm. I wasn't <laughs> going to... <laughs> so to it speak. It works on so many levels. It does. Hey, it sure does. I wasn't going to come on the show, but... Uh, uh, I'm I glad you did. Inst Instagram is in here. But guess what? Guess what? Last week, we had an exciting show because we showed off uh, some pop vinyls. Well, guess what? I went back on an adventure and I got more You got pop another pop vinyl. vinyl. Seriously? I got a Nazgul... Really? Pop vinyl. This Look is how amazing so that. cool. The Nazgul pop vinyls are the most amazing thing you guys have. Well, look at the silver paint. Look at the detail in the paint. I know. Dude. It looks like metal. Do you know what? They even got all the dirt, little flecks of dirt and mud on their robes. Yep. That's so cool. The detail so on the cool. Nazgul, the Nazgul pop you know vinyl what? The is question, amazing. The They're... question arises, why weren't any of these characters from Lord of the Rings released earlier on Funko Pop vinyl? Why not? It's probably The, the license is probably cheaper right now. Okay. Um, look, Whoa, and, and wow. ev everybody, okay. everybody I talk to says, every company I talk to says, uh, Lord of the Rings merch doesn't sell. I'm like, yeah, right, you're wrong. You are totally wrong. These are sold out everywhere. You can't find these. So I have to go to Barnes & Noble. Yes. Um, and then the person cool. in front of me bought the last Nazgul. So I went back to Hot Topic, the oh, same Hot Topic, and they got a restock. Check it out. Hot Topic got a restock, and they didn't have any more of the Sarum, uh, the, 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 the Gandalfs, but they had a Nazgul. So I got a Nazgul. And then so, so I looked at it. I said, look, I've got the Glow that? in the Dark Witch King. Which is the coolest. Right? Yeah. I got a Glow in the Dark Witch King. Glow I have, I have a giant Smaug. Yeah. I am still looking for the Balrog. And uh, now I've got a Nazgul, and so I'm like, you know what? Is this a present for Tiffany? If I've got, if I'm going to go all in on bad guys, I'm going to go all yes, in yes, on bad yes. guys. Yes, 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 Christopher Lee. And oh, I got yes. Saruman. Oh, yes. I got oh, the yes. Saruman pop vinyl, and I, I, I've decided that I'm only going to collect the bad guys. Of really? Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. I'm only going to collect the bad guys from now on. I have, I have pop vinyls of Sam. This is great. Um. But from now on, this it's great. all about bad guys. So wow, he's I, even... need, I need an Azarg. I need... Uh, 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 what was Jed Brophy's character? This is so cool. This is Saruman it... design is cool. He's got a glowing... Palantir. It, it's a Palantir, which is a crystal clear red evil orb that he's holding in his hand. This is so cool. This is so cool. Aren't those I'm digging rad? this. The Nazgul looks more amazing in person than you can possibly imagine. I'm Tiffany digging this. Tiffany says, my birthday is coming up very soon. <laughs> oh, what is this? You're giving, away, you're giving away my evil pop vinyls already. I'm not giving anything away. I, okay. just, I just thought you wanted to show Tiffany because, you know. Yeah. Okay, because you just wanted to show her. I just wanted to show, and look, I, I we've been telling everybody. <laughs> you can see it, weeks. but you can't have it. <laughs> I've been, I've been, it's the story of my life. Uh, we've been telling everybody oh. for two weeks now. Do not order your pop vinyls online. Go on an adventure. If yes. there's one thing that Bilbo and Tolkien have taught us is that you live life by going on an adventure. This is very true. That's actually the best scene in the entire Hobbit trilogy. Nine hours of movie, movie 
can be condensed in one scene. I'm going on an adventure! Like, that's <laughs> it. So, Green Zoe says that I should collect the good guys while you're collecting the bad guys, yes. and we should stage our own little Funko Pop version of LOTR. Deal. Which I, I love I'll that idea. I'll do that on Instagram. That's hilarious. I'll do the bad guys, okay. I'll parry, and then you parry with a good guy Instagram post, and then I'll parry back with a bad guy. Okay. Anyway, so okay. that I highly recommend going on an adventure. You start at Hot Topic, then you go to Barnes & Noble, and then you from there you go to Toys R Us, Walmart, Target, um, Walgreens even has pop vinyls. You might be able to get a rare, that. exclusive Look at that uh, uh, pop vinyl at Walgreens because nobody knows to shop there for pop vinyls. So that's been the secret weapon for a lot of people going to Walgreens really? to find a Walgreens pop vinyl. Walgreens of all but places? I highly recommend starting at Hot Topic. Digging that. And then the second place you go is I'm Barnes & Noble. This. I'm still looking for a Balrog. If every if anybody knows where to find the Balrog, let me know uh, because I want to see it. But you guys, go on an adventure. We've had so many people tweet us and tell us on Instagram this week that they went on an adventure and they found some rare pop vinyls when they went on the adventure. When all hope was lost, when they were doing their online shopping, they actually left the house, went on an adventure, and they found what they were looking That's for. That's exactly how it works. That's how that is exactly retail how it works. works. You're welcome. I enjoy, I much is, more enjoy yes. wasting gas and driving around town and going to stores <laughs> than, than just clicking through uh, expressionless on a bunch of websites. I completely agree. I like to get out of the house, get some fresh air, get my walking stick, get my favorite map of the Shire so that I can see all my favorite hiking trails and paths through all the lands of the Four Farthings. And sometimes I'll hike as far as Frogmorton and I'll go all the way there, and I just might make it back home in time for supper. Unless I stop at Farmer Maggot's house, because his wife really knows how to cook. Farmer Maggot's wife, best cook in the East Farthing. She's awesome. Arwen and Gold I'm going to says, stop there for stuffed mushrooms I'm going on an and yummy food. To get That's some what I'm going to do. Uh, Beth, uh, Caroline says, Justin, do you have a store called FYE for your entertainment? No, we do not have that here. I know what store you're talking about. We do not have these here in Los Angeles or the Southern California area. Uh, Jean Bourgeois says, I could think of better adventures than going to stores. Sorry, Justin. Are you kidding? There is no better adventure than going shopping and finding something that you are really excited Quite and proud of Quite agreed. and would, yes. would pay any price and it's even it feels even better when you get it at the regular price 9.99 and so they, they, look i've climbed he's, half he's, dome i've climbed angels landing i've been to all the great national parks you've been with me on many of them we've seen the geysers at yellowstone zion we, national park bryce canyon some of been, the most outstanding places on earth we've ran with the buffalo we literally ran with the buffalo we're not lying and you've and been that giant ram that so, had that ram yes that sheep that sheep with the yeah, ram mountain goats the mountain rams who coming after me oh so, my gosh look i know all about <laughs> adventures i, I know scared. how to have adventures, but something about shopping for pop vinyls and finding limited edition Hobbit and Lord of the Rings pop vinyls I think just gives me a thrill as much as the top of half. Dome Justin, we certainly appreciate that nostalgic uh, kick that you have for brick and mortar stores, and I also agree we should support our mom and pop stores. How else is the economy going to keep going the way it goes? You know, support your local retailers, and I do agree that's fabulous. Now, to answer a question that came um, not so long ago in our Instagram chat, I think there was an individual who asked about three or four times, is there any news about a new Tolkien movie, a new Lord of the Rings movie? Or uh, a biogra biographical and movie? They, no, they weren't specifically asking about that. They were just asking, is there another, you know, Tolkien or Lord of the Rings movie? And the answer is no. There's no new Lord of the Rings movies and there's no Silmarillion movie. No, it's the same thing we say every week ad nauseum forever. There is no Silmarillion and no new Lord of the Rings and no new Hobbit movie. However, everybody gets to enjoy, you know, the new book, the new book that you're seeing right here, the Baron and Luthien book. And there are whispers in the wind as we read The Hollywood Reporter That's and right. we read Daily Variety. This is what we read when we're here in Los Angeles. It's the done thing to keep up with the industry. We understand that there are two competing biopics 
you know, a biography motion picture. Not one, but there are two of them. Of Tolkien. That are going to tell some of the life story, if and not a larger chunk of the life story, of Professor J.R.R. Tolkien. And we've only seen we've, Tolkien we've represented got to wait and see. on screen twice. Most recently, he was on a uh, an episode of Heroes of Tomorrow. Right? No? Edge of Tomorrow? No. Uh, uh, Tomorrow Leaders? No, what's the name of that show? What are you talking about? On the CW. Yes, yes Mickey Mark. Uh, Heroes. He's, he's Legends. He's talking Legends. about Legends of Tomorrow. Legends of Tomorrow. Featured, but yes, Mickey Mark, that is true. Featured a World War One story arc at the uh, at the end of the season where they met up with J.R.R. Tolkien. But yes. b- before that, we've actually yes. seen Tolkien represented on screen in a wonderful dramatic film called Shadowlands. If you have Amazon or Netflix or any of those movie yes. sites or iTunes, look up a movie called Shadowlands. You will you will love it. It is directed by Sir Richard Attenborough, who has done so many wonderful films, and of course he was Doctor Hammond in Jurassic Park. But he's he's the brother of the the the, the planet Earth Attenborough, and Sir Richard Attenborough. I mean he's just a legend, right? He directed a movie called Shadowlands, starring right. Anthony Hopkins as C.S. Lewis. And of course, if you're going to have a movie about C.S. Lewis and uh, the, the his late life um, love interest and his late life finding of religion, uh, you have to include a character based on Tolkien. So the the uh, not the antihero, but the the antagonist of Shadowlands is a composite of Tolkien. And if you want to see uh, as close representation to what J.R.R. Tolkien would be on camera. Watch the movie Shadowlands. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. How about that? Have a great show, Tiffany. Thank you. You got to run. Well, I miss Tiffany. Run, run with the How wolves. How could I miss someone I haven't met before? Run with the wolves, it's sweetheart. It's such an internet thing to say. What? I'm missing someone that I have never met before. Yeah, Bethany Myers in our Facebook uh, uh, says yes. Shadowlands, a totally awesome movie. Yeah. We wow. Get, and she puts wow. Yeah, we get an inside it, it, look at C.S. Lewis and a, I, a character who is unnamed as his friend, Tolkien. But yeah. He's the main antagonist. And I, yeah. te- I tell you what, though, I, w- I went into that movie not expecting how powerful of a movie it is. And I don't want to spoil it, but it's an amazing film about C.S. Lewis. Indeed. His relationship with Tolkien and his l- late life relationship um, uh, with a woman. So, I highly recommend. Uh, Penny Young is asking, is anyone planning to going to this in Oxford next year? A major exhibition to explore Tolkien's vast creative genius. Of course, this is celebrating 80 years of Tolkien. That's what we're doing right now. This year will be the 80th uh, anniversary of the first publication of The Hobbit. And that that is this fall. Oh my goodness. Uh, so we'll be celebrating all year long. We're going to Comic-Con no, and we'll be celebrating Tolkien's uh, 80th anniversary. Yeah, to answer your question, yes, we go to Comic-Cons all the time. Uh, the One Ring.net has a staff and volunteers who are at the East Coast, New York City Comic Con, in the Midlands, at Chicago, at C2E2, and ourselves, we often have our you know local Southern California staff at all the big events like WonderCon and San Diego Comic Con to answer that question very quickly. And no, Neil Stranahan, I'm sorry, let us clarify, the movie Shadowlands, starring Sir Anthony Hopkins from HBO's Westworld, and obviously Silence of the Lambs and a lot of other movies, no, and, Shadowlands is not... And the soon-to-be classic Transformers, The uh-huh. Last Night. Shadowlands is not about Tolkien. It's about it's, C.S. Lewis. It's about C.S. Lewis, who wrote The Chronicles of Narnia. The, and Caitlin so, Griffin just, just confirms so you guys got that in right. the it's chat about room Lewis, not uh, Tolkien. that it is on Netflix. Thank you, Kay, for checking on Netflix. I Shadowlands. Shadowlands, How about Shadowlands that? is on Netflix. So this is super cute. I tell you what, though. Good it, stuff. I, I never got into toy. I don't own any toys. I hate collecting things. In fact, I never even opened the gift bags that I got at the Lord of the Rings Oscar parties that the One Ring put on. I still have those, all the items still in the bag. Uh, and the bag is falling apart because it's a paper bag. So I don't collect anything. <laughs> I don't open anything. So but the fact- sudden, then why the sudden fascination with Funko I Pops? S- I, look, I Except saw. Except they've written you a big fat check because we've no. talked about them three I weeks wish. in a row, giving lots of I'm precious addicted. airtime cr- to talk about I Funko saw, Pop. I, so I'd like to see the residual check that they're giving look, you. I saw, so- <laughs> I saw someone collect that that glow in the dark Nazgul, and I'm like, you know what? No toys ever interested <laughs> me, but a glow glow in the dark Witch King sounds amazing. It is cool. And then though. I, I went to admit, there. That's cool. I went there. 
and I saw the Samwise and I texted a couple other of our staffers. I'm like, hey, is the Samwise hard to find? And they're like, yes, pick it up. So I, <laughs> I, I and from there, now I've got the Nazgul, now I've got the Saruman. I think I'm just gonna get bad guys from now on. I'm, uh, I'm officially addicted to, to pop vinyls. That's awesome. Because I'm addicted to them too. And that's the reason why I've avoided buying all of the Game of Thrones Funko Pops. And now I have to avoid buying all of the Lord of the Rings Funko Pops because that is this is plastic crack addiction. I know exactly what Diane I know exactly what it's about. says I will take it off your hands. Bethany Myers says Shadowlands was also made into a play version. I saw it here in San Diego just a month ago at the Lambs Players Theater. It was just outstanding. Looking forward to seeing you all at Con in July. Thanks all you guys to celebrate the world talking. You're awesome. Hey, looking forward to seeing you. Uh, keep your Friday evening open. We can't say or announce anything just yet, but San Diego Comic Con, keep your Friday open. That's all I would say. You've got to have toys in your collection, Justin. This is all I have. I don't. Do. I don't collect anything else. Uh, a, a few people are saying, I don't have Netflix. Uh, Erevani says, I wonder if Netflix is Shadowlands. And I think we just confirmed it. Uh, Erevani says, Justin, if you find any good guy Funkos you don't want, feel free to send them my way. Uh, like, yes, I've got indeed. two Samwise yes, up indeed. there, and those are waiting for Sean Astin's autograph. Uh, indeed, so that's good. They will, cannot... We'll get Sean to sign them. We have to. I just did a big, big wedding this weekend, and do you know what I was? I was dressed as Gandalf. Do you want to be you wanna believe it? You're going to have to. Kaylin says, I speak the it's truth. not. I she can't find it. Okay, well anyways, I'm, I'm very excited to say that the official hardcore wedding season in mid-June has kicked off to a blazing start and I got hired by this wonderful uh, bride and groom who really love uh, all this fantasy storytelling and they love Lord of the Rings and as many weddings as I have done as a minister or rather just an officiant, I've never had to do cosplay and this time it was hilarious. It was really, really, really funny. I've got to show you a picture, Justin. Poppy J just me dressed Poppy as Gandalf J at the wedding. It was so just funny. Check Netflix. Shadowlands is not on Netflix. I misspoke. I That's apologize. That's too bad. Shadowlands is not on Netflix, but I don't know if it's oh, well. on Prime. Amazon Prime. Does anyone have Amazon Prime and can check that out? Do you know what you do? You go online to your local public library. And there they will have the DVD. You can check it out it's for free. So it will cost you century. nothing. And even better, most of the public libraries, at least the ones here in Los Angeles, have now updated digital media files so that you don't have to physically get a DVD copy checked out like a book. You can use your library card and you can watch downloadable movies on your device, on your tablet, straight from the public library no cost at all, as if you were checking out a book. It's a fantastic thing. So, yes, there's a way for you to get your hands on Shadowlands. If you really look hard enough, I'm sure you can find it. I've never been in a library that I've checked something out on. I go as a tourist to big libraries, mm. but I've never I've never carried a library card, and I've never That's checked great. anything out at a library. Every, every time a I need book, to find... Movie, anything. When I need to find an out-of-print DVD or something that hasn't been out and I don't feel like dropping $19 at Amoeba to buy it used, I can go right to the library and find it anywhere and everywhere. And it's amazing. Hey, read, guys. Go to your public libraries. And as a point of mentioning it, while we're talking about this, I heartily recommend that you support your local libraries. You really should. I do. I think it's a fantastic thing. Hey, question. Reading, reading is fundamental. <laughs> All right. Justin's off to do a business call. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen at some point. And now we can actually talk about other things besides Funko Pop. It seems that every time Justin comes on the air, we have to dedicate 45 minutes to talking about his favorite toys when we have other fun things to talk about, too. Yo, hey, Tom Fernandez. Yo, how you doing? Now, talking to our friends up there, Bruna, you think it's on YouTube? Yes, you can always find illegal copies of movies that are reproduced although they shouldn't be reproduced on YouTube and sometimes you find good copies and sometimes you find really 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 crappy copies anyways somebody asked in the chat whether we're gonna go to Salt Lake City Comic Con I don't have any plans and no we have not talked about going to Salt Lake City Comic Con however we do have some of our wonderful uh, the one ring.net staffers mr. Sear he is a very talented writer 
and blogger, and he was embedded on the set of the Hobbit films. He was down there in New Zealand for months and months and months, uh, looking at all the cool stuff that they were producing during the production of the Hobbit trilogy. And you know what? You should ask him. If you guys are going to go to Salt Lake City Comic Con, and I remember a few years ago, they had branched out and they had done Fantasy Con. Everybody remember Fantasy Con? Yes. They were struggling to get this really big, beautiful show off the ground, and it was really cool. I mean, I loved Fantasy Con, but I don't think they came back for a second or a third year, unless I'm mistaken. So, yeah, you, you should check out uh, any of the listings or details in Salt Lake City Comic Con, and we'll find out if our staff people and our volunteers who are there in the Great Salt Lake area will be able to go and be part of that convention. Hey, Shadowlands is on Vudu, it's on Google Play, and it's on Amazon Video. Very good. Very, very, very good. Concerning Hobbits, lovely to see you as always. Do we go to Dragon Con? Yes, we're always at Dragon Con. Maybe this year there's a question mark associated because Dragon Con has removed the Tolkien track out of all the programming. Really. Yeah, no. Oh, you want pictures, Bethany? Bethany wants pictures of the Gandalf costume. <laughs> I'm gonna... I'm gonna see if I can uh, find a good Gandalf picture with me in this crazy costume. It was really wonderful. Penny Young, you are super, super awesome. Yeah, support your local library. And a lot of them in major cities have an online app called Hoopla and other types that let you have downloads of their movies. Super, super awesome sauce. Wow, look at this. Opening up, I'm gonna open up my picture gallery. Here's my picture gallery. And we're gonna see this really cool picture. Hey, how you doing? I'm gonna see if I can show you guys. Oh yeah, this is fun. <laughs> Here's me in the Gandalf costume with one of the groomsmen. Check that out. I know you guys can't see this. I'm going to show my friends in the world of Instagram. I'm going to show you that real quick. And then I'm going to show you guys at home because it's worth a laugh. Well, I think this is funny. I think this is really, really, really funny. Oh, yeah, here I am. Cool. <laughs> here I am with the bride and the groom. And I let, I let her hold the wizard staff because it was really cool. There's me doing the wedding, the whole wedding in Gandalf costume. How fun is that? I'm just looking at all the hearts explode on Instagram because it's hilarious. Okay, I'm going to show the folks at home. There's me in a Gandalf costume. So funny. So funny. To me, anyways. And you know, I think the bride and groom really liked it too. I think, yeah, they really enjoyed this. Grand scale. There it is. Gandalf. Not the white. Because Gandalf the White is somewhat stuffy and a little bit too formal, you know? The only Gandalf who should officiate your wedding should be Gandalf the Grey. Gandalf the Grey, because he's a lot more fun, right? He knows how to dance and party with the hobbits at birthday parties. He knows how to create beautiful fireworks. We don't have any evidence anywhere that Gandalf the White ever freaking bothered to do a single firework. And as Bilbo says famously in the movie, he wouldn't miss a chance to let off his whiz puppers. You know, and all the little kids, you know, running around uh, to chase Gandalf's cart, and he lets loose a couple of little fireworks early in the afternoon just to freak the kids out, you know. And then everybody's favorite bit of comedy from the opening of Fellowship of the Ring when grouchy, grouchy Odo Proudfoot is looking at Gandalf going and then he sees the fireworks go off of course and the kids are laughing and giggling and Odo Proudfoot goes <laughs> and his wife comes up and looks at him and goes and he goes and he changes his face I'm telling you Odo Proudfoot believe it or not is my favorite side character in the Fellowship of the Ring he's just the best he doesn't have any dialogue except one single word. In the middle of Bilbo's birthday speech, he, he corrects the birthday boy, and he shouts out, Proud Feet! Which is a gag that was stolen, well, from Ralph Bakshi's animated film. It was exactly the same, shot for shot. Gandalf is there at the party, the hobbits are eating and partying, Bilbo gets up and does his speech, and the same shot that Ralph Bakshi created with the camera in the position to see 
Odo Proudfoot sticking his feet in the camera, and the farmer says, Proud feet! So grumpy. I love that guy. You know, you guys, you love that guy as much as me, but I think one of the sweetest, most endearing moments in all of the Lord of the Rings movies, probably more endearing to me than... All the jokes with Merry and Pippin, really. And I love those guys, and they get all the comedy. But when Odo Proudfoot is laughing and giggling at the little children who are really enjoying Gandalf's fireworks in that little minute, and then his wife comes out and scowls at him, and he changes his face again, I'm telling you, I just love it. I just, I melt every time. I love that stuff. I'm easily entertained, I guess. I just love it. So before our special guest arrives to, you know, increase our profile, and we're going to talk about some really interesting subjects. Hey, Jacob. Good to see you, Jacob. And uh, there's Ken, Jean Bourgeois, and there's Scott Weir, all of our good friends in the Facebook chat, and over there in Ustream. Hey, Marfles. What are you doing there, Marfles? Too much tourism, but I loved it. Are you talking about going to, oh, going to Edinburgh in the summer? Mmm, yeah, there's a lot of tourists. Because what? In that period of summertime, England gets all the tourists because the rest of the year you have crappy crappy weather you know what it's like look i have watched enough <laughs> antiques roadshow <laughs> in england okay i know i know exactly what the weather is like i know how bad it can be i'm telling you and me i've traveled to england i've been there i know what it's like so i'm not the least bit surprised that all the tourists in the world cram their visitations into england in that one small month yeah, I know, it. Well, I know where Edinburgh is. I know. I know exactly where it is. Hey, have you guys seen this? This is brand new. I know that we were talking about Funko Pop and the really cool Nazgul and the Saruman toys. No, we were talking about these because they're super cool. But have you guys seen this? Have you got your hands on this? Baron and Luthien. Insane how beautiful this edition is. This is a beautiful edition. Love it. Yes, yes, yes. It's your idea. You stick it in the ground. No, no, no. It's your idea. You stick it in the ground. You know, I love the Marion Pippin jokes, but this, this beautiful thing. Look at that. Look at that. Baron and Luthien. And what do you, what do you suppose that is? This beautiful, very recognizable monogram. J.R.R. Tolkien's monogram. His initials, J.R.R.T., designed into his own perfect ellipsis. So gorgeous. This edition is gorgeous. And you know what? It's worth every penny. Worth every penny. I'm telling you guys, I'm going to be reading this on the plane. I'm flying tomorrow. Yes, that's right. I'm flying, taking a very long, long flight off to visit my friends in Florida and my family. And so, yes, Super good, you guys. I'm so glad I got my hands on this. Uh, Erevandi says, Cliff, Baron and Luthien is sitting on the arm of my chair right now. Perfect. Excellent. A lot of you folks who live in the United Kingdom were lucky enough to go and meet Alan Lee, who did these beautiful, beautiful uh, illustrations in here. Wow, this is cool. Oh, man. I mean, he has such a light touch with his watercolors. Oh, look at all these werewolves. Oh, cool. Look at all these, like demon werewolves and stuff. Wow. This is so cool. I'm going to show you guys this. Here's Alan Lee's illustration of all of these crazy werewolves. The island of werewolves. Yes. Mardi Gras. Hey, Mardi Gras. I would like to use my superpowers to get Alan Lee to come to the United States. If I could do that, I would, you know, I would wave my wand and I would get my Patronus out of my wand to go and chase him down and my Patronus if I could would lead Alan Lee back here to our blessed shores a far green country which is how I sometimes refer to us no I don't I don't but hey anyways super cool stuff the idea of having Alan Lee be our guest on this show is kind of mind-blowing I don't know if it could ever happen I don't know if it could ever happen but you know what I would I would bend rivers. I would move mountains. I would lift the heavens from the firmament to get a chance to bring Alan Lee on this show. I would. I would move heaven and earth. I would move the stars 
that wield over in heavens. I, I, I would do all that. But hey, Alan Lee's not coming here in the near future, but I wish you would. That'd be great. Yeah, fly, you fools. Who is this? Well, hello, who are you? Who am I? Who are you? You're watching my show. Welcome to our show. For those audience members who are now just joining us, asking who the hell I am, ha ha ha, this is the OneRing.net. For a reminder, we are the biggest, the largest, the most comprehensive worldwide fan website. Not just a website, but a web portal. We have news, information, events. Talk, uh, talk with fans and share your stories and your ideas on our live forums. We have a live chat, uh, Barliman's live chat, theonering.net. This is where you are. And who am I? My name is Clifford, also known as Quick Beam, one of the senior writers and editors of theonering.net. And incidentally, I was the guy who uh, co-created and wrote and produced Ringers, Lord of the Fans, our feature-length documentary about the phenomenon of worldwide fan audience. So, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a writer, and uh, we've got a lot of material out the door with the OneRing.net. And here's our show, Torn Tuesday. Yeah, in other words, is Alan Lee hard to get a hold of? He is notoriously reclusive. Notoriously reclusive. You know, once upon a time, animation director Ralph Bakshi was notoriously reclusive. And, you know, he was just hidden away on his ranch out in the desert, keeping to himself. And it's nice to see him coming out now for more public events. It's really, really cool. And uh, maybe someday, if we reach out, if we do the proper outreach, we might get Alan Lee on our show. And because it was Gay Pride this past weekend, here in North America, and in many other cities and communities around the world, we have comic books f that are here. I'm gonna show you guys this copy of Love is Love, and we've got The Hobbit, the only existing comic book adaptation of The Hobbit. But the reason why um, I'm so enamored with this Love is Love book, it was published as a combined effort with IDW and DC Comics. And uh, it was published one year ago when all of those innocent young men and women were shot to death at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. And in the face of that tragedy, some of the most amazing artists, comic book artists and comic book writers, came together to make this beautiful volume called Love is Love to raise money for the victims and the victims' families from that horrible, horrible, horrible uh, mass shooting that happened at the Pulse nightclub last year. And the names of the victims are published right inside right here, in honor of them, in this main cover. There are such beautiful artists right here in this edition of Love is Love. Worth mentioning, because we're here at this beautiful comic book store, Meltdown Comics, which hosts us here every week for our live show. And of significant note, for all you Harry Potter fans, this book that I hold in my hand is the only, one and only single instance of an authorized, Harry Potter comic adaptation page. And it's only a one page. It is only one single splash page. The artwork is gorgeous. And it features our characters, Ron, Hermione, and Harry. And it is the only one in existence. There's no other Harry Potter comic book ever, anywhere. And I'm gonna see if I can find this beautiful page and show it to you. Uh, it has a quote from Albus Dumbledore. Um, it's really gorgeous. Yeah, check this out. This is so cool. I gotta find this in here. And every time I go looking for it, I can never find it. Is it in here? Yep. There it is. There it is, near the very, very back. Wow. This is the quote from Albus Dumbledore. Differences of habit and language are nothing at all if our aims are identical and our hearts are open. Right here. Ladies and gentlemen, the only Hobbit comic book ever in existence, and the only Harry Potter comic ever in existence, found in the pages of this LGBT uh, Love is Love. There it is. I'm going to show everybody. There it is. There's Harry, Ron, and Hermione, and Albus Dumbledore. 
This is so cool. So, I thought this was a unique thing to bring this in honor of the one year anniversary of the shootings at the Pulse nightclub and uh, in honor of all of our LGBT brothers and sisters who are out there, get a copy of this, Love is Love, published by DC Comics and IDW. Very, very cool. And if you can get your hands on this, you'll be very lucky to find this, The Hobbit, which was published by Eclipse Books. You know what? It doesn't, it's, it's been way out of print for a long, long, long time. Jeez, this came out in 19... <whistles> when was this published? You've got to be kidding me. 1989? No way! Yeah, guys, this came out in 1989. I thought it was old. <laughs> Eclipse Books. In fact, I think that imprint doesn't exist anymore. But how cool is this? The Hobbit, it is one of three. There are three volumes. And I think that the reprint, the reprint of The Hobbit comic book is a combined edition that has all three of the original volumes. So here it is. You can find this on eBay for some outrageous amount of money, I'm sure. But uh, uh, let's see. Are you coming? I'm asking our guest if he's going to show up or not. Let's see. Let's hope an Alan Lee interview goes better than the Bakshi interview. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think an Alan Lee interview might be the best interview that we'd ever, ever have. I mean, I think some of the best interviews that I've had were Sylvester McCoy. I loved interviewing Sylvester McCoy. My interview with uh, Dominic Monaghan and, and Billy Boyd together is internet famous. It's one of my favorite interviews as well. I've had brilliant interviews with Sean Astin many times, but... Wow, I would. I would love to get Alan Lee on this show. It would be really fantastic. Um, so, I wanted to really mention this because they're the only Harry Potter and the only Hobbit comics ever adapted. And what is unique about this beautiful, beautiful story, uh, these beautiful stories in here, this commemorative edition, Love is Love, it's so worth getting. Really, really, really worth getting. All right, what else do we have? Ah, in the world of fantasy comic book adaptations, The Dark Crystal. Yes, The Dark Crystal. Creation Myths, published by Archaea, Archaea Books. Well, <laughs> Acacia Wolf, have I met Billy Boyd? Sweetheart, I've interviewed all these people so many countless times. I have, there isn't anybody on the list. I've interviewed Miranda Otto, David Wenham, Harry Sinclair, who played Isildur. I've interviewed everybody. Liv Tyler, Orlando Bloom, Peter Jackson, Fran Walsh, Philippa Boyens, uh, Dan Henna, the art director. I've interviewed the people behind Weta, you know, Tanya Rogers and Sir Richard Taylor. Uh, uh, fantastic artists. I've interviewed everybody in front of the camera and behind the camera. And God knows you can look at an archive. We've got lots of YouTube videos that archive our show, theonering.net. Sean Bean, you know what? Yes, I've interviewed Sean Bean. I bumped into him at uh, the Four Seasons Hotel when they were having a big after party. Hey, Kieran. Hey, Kieran, you made it onto the show. That's very good to see you, buddy. Um, I I've met them all. I've interviewed them all. And if you would like to see the results of all of my efforts interviewing these people, then get a copy of my movie, Ringers. R-I-N-G-E-R-S. Ringers, Lord of the Fans. Get a copy, and you can see, you know, some of the insight and some of the uh, investigation we've done making that documentary film, looking at all aspects of Western popular culture responding to Tolkien over all of these years. Well, Umarak the Hunter, you've got me beat. Out of me dropping all those names, and I just did, I dropped a lot of names. Oh, wait, what's this? It's a name. Oh, wait, wait, I just dropped something else. Let me pick it up. Oh, it's another name. Sorry. <laughs> Umarak the Hunter, you got me there. The only one, one single person out of the cast of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit that I did not interview was Sir Christopher Lee, to my never-ending shame. I am shamed, and I continue to be shamed. Yes, it's true. But uh, I gotta say, I'd love, I would love to get out my Ouija board or, <laughs> or you know some other means of going beyond the veil of the unseen world. 
I would really love to talk to Christopher Lee, but ain't happening. It's too bad. Um, high on the list of readables, everybody in Tolkien world, all you fans in the Tolkien fandom, if you really want to get your hands on really cool comic books, scour around for the reprint of The Hobbit that was first uh, published in 1989. I believe it came out in 1990. Find this. There's the three-volume edition of The Hobbit. The watercolors are really cool. Some really interesting artwork. Uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. This is really kind of cool. There you go. There's the stone giants. They don't look like giant stone faces. They're actually just stone giants. Hey, look, Tolkien Girl. You found it, the Hobbit graphic novel. Yes, Tolkien Girl, you absolutely found it. That's super cool. Super, super, super cool. We can leave that door open because it's the only way we get ventilation. We can leave that door open. And I want, I'm want. i glad Tolkien Girl is keeping up with us. Bam, bam, bam. And Kay, thank you, Kaylin Griffin. The Dark Crystal. Feel the power of the Dark Crystal. So good. Can't get enough of Archaea books. And you know what they've got? They've got a brand new comic book series called The Power of the Dark Crystal. Oh. What the hell? Oh, jeez. Oh. oh, no. Oh. There's oh, a, hi, everyone. There's a, somebody just oh. sprang up out of the sprout. Oh. Nowhere. Someone sprouted out of the ground. Oh, it's hot down there under the table where I live. <laughs> what happened? Oh my god. Oh my gosh, we just lost. Oh, hey, we just lost our Instagram because the table got knocked over. <laughs> but what happened? That was my fault. Hi, everyone. Hey, Umarik. Well, if you know any ways to summon a vampire, then I think this is the only way we can get. Yes, you're right, Umarik. If I could summon a vampire, that might be one of the only ways I could get to talk to. You kind of just did. Me. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> hey, surprise, everybody. It's Ben, rock and roll Ben, Ricci. The, uh, one of the most talented musicians I know. Well, death metal Ben, to be more, more De accurate. Death metal Ben. Breaking the law, breaking the law. But I don't think Judas Priest counts as death metal. Not even close. Not even close. But yeah. I grew up on my brother playing all these albums for me. It was, oh, yeah. it was all the time. It was Ronnie James Dio. It was Judas Priest. It was a classic Black Sabbath. And, of course, in the 80s, Black Sabbath reinvented themselves with the mob rules. <laughs> Judas Priest my favorite Love Classic it. heavy metal vocal. Classic heavy metal. Oh, yeah. he's great. He's great. What is this? It's the new Tolkien book. Ladies oh. and gentlemen, everybody say hello to Ben. That's right. Everybody, uh, see, there. There's, I'm coming in late <laughs> on this. but uh, Celtic Frost. Well, hey, Scott Weir is mentioning Celtic Frost. Oh, there you go. There's there some, uh, some true black metal yeah, right there. There you go. Good stuff. Super, super good stuff. Oh, yeah. We, we, uh, hi. This? Look, everyone says, hey, do you like this Obey? Now, if, if Sauron had a political message on his political yes, posters. It yes, would, that would be it would good. would be obey. That would be, be the same thing for Trump, I think. He yeah. probably, yeah, probably. Praise and obey. You're yeah. getting a thousand uh, hellos and hearts. Hello, everyone. Take care, you, Tolkien girl. Anyways. Green Zowie and Nell Strahan and, oh, God. Good night, Tolkien girl. Great Hello, to have human you on the that show. scared me from a casual. <laughs> 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 it scared me, too. Oh, yes. That's hilarious. This is the brand new uh, Baron and Luthien book. That was assembled by Christopher Tolkien okay. using unused... Would that be um, J.R.R.'s son or grandson? His son. Okay. One of his only surviving... He's 93 or 92 years old oh now. Oh, my God. One of... Now, Professor Tolkien had four children. Two of them survive. Priscilla, his only daughter, and Christopher, his youngest son. Do they Hello, have any kids? Hello, Graystill Skies. It's good to see you. Uh, uh, there are grandchildren. And rocks like Striper. <laughs> <laughs> striper? <laughs> striper with a Y? Oh, yeah, my God. That's how they spelled it. Anything yeah, that had an I had to have a Y. Yes. But yes. Um, do any of his kids have kids? Are there grandchildren? Many. Yes. Oh, okay, In fact, good. I'm, I'm friends very close with his great-grandson, <laughs> Roy de Tolkien. Oh, well, excellent. It's yeah, he's great a talent. that the family line continues. Of course. And now, did you know that Simon Tolkien, who is a grandson of J.R.R. Tolkien, he is a successful author of John Grisham-style legal thrillers. Oh, really? He's got a whole career as a, as a, as a lawyer, and then he decided to go into a whole career writing these John Grisham like pot boilers. I was just going to ask if any of them also became successful writers. Yeah, so that's si great. Simon Tolkien. Believe it or not, the, not the only Tolkien in the box, out of all those crayons in the Tolkien box, who is a successful writer, Simon Tolkien does not write dragons in high fantasy. No. He writes these legal pot boilers. Yeah. It'd probably be 
harder to do that, not because it's harder to write for him, but because any fantasy thing he wrote would be in the shadow of his grandfather. Even, even his yeah. non-fantasy stuff that he's writing was in the fa- his yeah. grandfather's yeah. shadow. Yeah, so it's really, really cool. Uh, you know what we were just talking about? We were talking about the, the one and only Hobbit comic book adaptation. Oh, which I would was think there'd be many Hobbit only one. adaptations. That's the only There's one. There's a lot of Lord of the Rings adaptations, I bet. Um, maybe. But Lord of the Rings has not been licensed for graphic novel that I've seen. That would yeah, be an interesting thing. I just thing. assumed that it automatically would have been. Hey, Argentina. Welcome to the show, everybody. Um, and look at this. This was the... Um, yes, The Love is Love. The Love is Love volume, and uh, it contains the great. only Harry Potter comic page ever licensed in the world. The only one. Really? So what we're holding in our two I hands... I assume both of those things would have already had comic books. No, so. there's no comic book from the Harry Potter yeah. Wizarding World of J.K. Rowling, and so I've got in my hand part of this commemorative edition for the victims of the Pulse nightclub shooting, and there in the, near the very, very back is the one and only in existence Harry Potter page panel. Look at this. Oh, cool. Isn't that beautiful? The only one. That's nice. Some really good graphite. Yeah, really good graphite. And I'm telling you, by super Jim cool. Lee. Yep. Illustrated by Jim Lee. And read, read that quote. If people can see very well at all, this one right here. Yeah. Uh, the quote says, "Differences of habit and language are nothing at all if our aims are identical and our hearts are open." Albus Dumbledore. Bless you, Albus Dumbledore. From, Wisdom. From uh, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Wisdom. Wisdom from J.K. Rowling, who. You know, she's a human rights activist, and uh, she's uh, quite quite a famous, you know, uh, presence in, you know, the progressive voices that are out there on the internet. Yes, uh, and you can't Rowling. really uh, see it too well over from the camera up there. Maybe this one can get a better look, but the graphite work is so detailed yeah. on this. This it's, is it's really cool. Really good art by Jim Lee. Yeah. It says, all right, Marfles, all right, Marfles and Erevandi are talking in the Ustream chat saying, uh, I haven't gotten started yet. Eru, is it like the Silmarillion kind of reading? And Marfels, uh, in reply, Erevandi says to Marf, the first 39 pages are Christopher giving context for the first earliest version of the story. Talking about Baron and Luthien. Yeah, we're actually talking about, yeah, how this reads compared to the Silmarillion. You know, the Silmarillion is something that many, many people yeah. find difficult to read. It's just a collection of backstories. But, but It's, it's kind of like but it's not written the way a novel is written. No. It's it, written as like a historical listing of, like a, it's like Brewer's Biblical. It yeah, really is. I was just going to say it's kind of like the Bible of the Tolkien world. It is. For lack of a better term. It is. That's a, uh, that's a fine analogy. Yeah. It's a fine analogy. Well, and this seems like it would be that. Yes. Uh, I mean, what, what, you probably already covered this because I'm getting here late. <laughs> is this a, another collection of backstories and histories no, of the Tolkien world? No, this is this is one particular story of Baron and Luthien, which okay. is already found within the Silmarillion. But this is like a behind the scenes. From it's the like cover. It looks like they're elves. She is an elf. He is a, a mortal man. Oh, okay. And the story of Aragorn and Arwen is a refraction of their story, because uh-huh. she was forbidden to love him. Yes, by her father, and he fell in love with her and felt like Aragorn felt, felt guilty that she would give up her immortal life to be with him. But the, the tragedy and the adventure and the powerful story that they go through is unlike, and we're talking like an island of werewolves. We're talking about shape-shifting. We're talking about Huan, the giant hound, whose breath was so arduous that it would melt armor and people who attacked him. Such a cool story. Really, yeah, really cool. Sounds pretty but th- cool. This is the ultimate Romeo and Juliet. I was just gonna say, obvious the shades of ultimate. Romeo and Juliet. The, I mean, oh, oh, it always was, and it was meant to be the story of star-crossed lovers. And 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 are his people forbidding him from being with her, or that's just one-sided? Um, because she's the elf. Well, no, no. His his life is cursed and crowded with really bad things that aren't even related to meeting oh her, and and the intersection of their lives is quite interesting. But Baron and Luthien. Super, super, super cool, guys. This is like a behind-the-scenes book that shows how the manuscript changed. And Christopher Tolkien shows the earliest form of the story, which was written in this prose. Mm -hmm. And the other changing versions of the story, so that you could see exactly what characters were cut, and what changed, and what kernel of truth stayed in the story all the way through. So it's kind of like a deconstruction Mm -hmm. to see how Baron and Luthien came together. Yes. Super, super, super good stuff. Anyways, if you haven't seen it, 
highly recommend it. All right. And uh, hey, how you been? Ooh, all right. You doing good? Yeah, on the way here, I passed by uh, the Hollywood High 16 stair. I don't know if there's any people who like skateboarding out there, but the 16 stair at Hollywood High here in, Holly in Hollywood, California is probably the most famous handrail on the planet. Yeah, it's, skateboarding. it's one. I, there was, I see them there all the time filming. And there was a kid who could not have been more than 10 years old board really? sliding down it. And Perfect. he had like a whole crew of people and some of the, where they were trying to film him and Always. So I stayed to watch Always. a couple tries. Uh, Always. It's pretty amazing. I'm digging that, man. I love that. I, I love seeing, you know, that the skateboard culture, which is so unique to Southern California, here where we, we broadcast from, I love seeing it continue yeah. to another generation. I love it. This guy's... It always has. It always will. Hey. Hey. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Diane, Ben, Benren, and Luthien. Yeah. So you can play, <laughs> you can play the part of Baron, Benren. Let's see now. Is there? Is it true that a portrait of Gandalf is in Dumbledore's office? That's a good question. Pipske? That's a very good question. I don't know. I it is don't true know. that Ian McKellen was asked to take over the part of Dumbledore after the first actor died. Richard Harris. Yes. Yes. And yes, that's um, true. The first actor, Richard Harris, that's had true. said very negative things about Ian McKellen. Oh, they had a, a, gr a yeah. long spat that went yes, on for. And, and Ian yeah, McKellen yeah, felt yeah. Uh, he didn't feel right taking the part from someone who. That's right. Who did who disrespected him so much and did not approve of him and he felt that that would be wrong. He did because he told, he's a yeah. gentleman like that. Yeah, yeah. Richard Richard Harris was like you know all all about you know chastising Ian McKellen for being cold and technical as an actor. <laughs> Which is, that's what defeats me is, is like wait a minute someone said Ian McKellen was bad how does that too technical. <laughs> Whatever, Too caught up in the technique of acting to actually deliver a performance, according to Richard, Richard Harris. Richard Harris took him for a conjurer of cheap parlor tricks. Yes, he shouldn't, mm -hmm. he shouldn't have. He shouldn't have. Should not have done that. You want to see something funny? Do you want to see the picture of me dressed as Gandalf doing the wedding I did this weekend? Oh yeah, and I think Ian McKellen got the better <laughs> wizard anyway. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yes. Hey, hey. Just joining. Welcome, so Instagram. I'm sure who's, you've already shown this to everyone. Who is the handsome young guy? Well, you're not talking about me, the grouchy His name old is man. Cliff. Nah, yeah. Mm. You're not talking about the grouchy old senior member of this freaking show. But my name's Ben, and I live under the table. Thanks. I'll take um, it. This handsome young guy, <laughs> one of my best friends, a very smart fellow, a very accomplished musician. Now, tell me, because I'm just curious, and I don't think I've ever asked you this. Mm -hmm. What is it? that first got you into music where you decided, I, I have an aptitude for this. I'm going to pick up an instrument. I was raised in a musical household. You know. Brilliant. Um, my mom majored in upright bass and vocal music, and she has a doctorate in vocal performance. So wow. we're just raised to be musical. Well, that's great. And, yeah. That's great. That is so cool. <laughs> Thank you, Jane Spinner. That's funny. No, thanks. I'll, I'll take that. I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You are handsome, too, thanks. Cliff. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's good. That's good. A star is born. Uh, you know, wait, <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. Really, raised in a musical household, mm -hmm. then what was the first instrument you really bothered to play? I wanted Piano? to play saxophone. Um, that's what my mom played when she was a girl. They're very expensive instruments. Yes. Those like orchestral instruments are another level of price range. Yeah. So my mom found a way to get me a clarinet. Uh, didn't know it at the time, but she straight up stole it from a school that she worked at. Because it was the closest thing to a saxophone she could get. Mm. And getting a clarinet pretty much turned me off to woodwind instruments for a long time. Um, then my dad got me a guitar at 12. <laughs> and ah. and that's, that's where I found, you know, yeah. my, the thing that I wanted to stick with. And then bass at 16. And now I'm predominantly a bass player. Okay. Yeah. Predominantly a bass yeah. player. Professional for hire. Yep. You know, a private teacher. I've been a private guitar and bass mm. teacher for a better part of a decade. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah over, that's right. I think about a decade, actually. Thank you. And Thank you, by the way. That's really fun. I, I, that, that's really kind of cool. Um, back so, to this. Oh, back to Baron and Luthien. I, I, I'm, like, distracted by the power of music. Quasi-Romeo and Juliet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but it, Sounds like he doesn't have a family that doesn't want him to be with her, but she does. So she has the Romeo and Juliet parents. No, she, she, she has, you know, her father is Thingol. Thingol is one of the great elven lords of the First Age. Mm -hmm. And he he is so pissed off that his daughter might go hang around, hang around with this mortal man that he gives the young man an impossible task. 
an well, impossible not. task to prove his worth. So now we're kind of getting into the uh, the Greek legends yep, and exactly. Hercules with all of and, his uh, tasks and also and the Japanese like yes. legend of the the Japanese legend. You know, the tale of the bamboo cutter. You know, where the the uh, I don't think I know this one. The, the princess Kaguya sends all of the princes who are suiting one of these suitors, and she gives them all mythic impossible tasks just to throw them off. You yeah. know, and so in this story. Baron is charged with the task of going up against Morgoth, the original Dark Lord, the Dark Lord above all Dark Lords, who was the big boss above Sauron. Sauron was only a lieutenant, only a lieutenant uh, against Morgoth. And Baron is charged with going to Morgoth and stealing the Silmaril from off of his crown. And it's just such a story. It's such a story. I'm telling you guys. Uh, the reason why music is always fascinating to me is because in the Silmarillion, all of Tolkien's creation mythology is built around music. The music of the spheres, which, you know, Dante writes about in the Divine Comedy. A lot of people write about the music of the spheres. But in Professor Tolkien's Legendarium, the essence of the creation of the world, everything about it is based on music. You know? Oh, hey, Raul... Raul in our uh, Facebook um, in our Facebook Live says that Thingol is such a hypocrite. He married up, yeah, he married up just as much as Baron did, maybe more. Very true, incredibly true. Because Thingol, who would be Luthien's dad, who says, "I don't want you hanging around with this mortal man." Mm -hmm. When Thingol got married, he didn't even marry an elf princess. He married a Maiar spirit. You know what I mean? He oh, married okay. up. He married from like. We all know the Maiar yeah. spirits. I yeah, mean, you come know. Come on, this is basic stuff. The basic stuff. I have no idea what you're talking about. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't this cool? Let me show you this. There. This is a little. This is the the wedding venue. Look at that. Oh. Uh, yeah. And of course, the groom's a long hair. Of course. Yeah, he loved oh, it. That's great. Isn't that hilarious? This is. I'm showing him the wedding yes. picture with me as Gandalf. You can, for a price, have uh, Gandalf. Yes, you can. Marry you. For the proper he, price, you he can hire me, and I will marry you. Can officiate a wedding. This yes. man is licensed. This I, is real. I will officiate your wedding, and I will sign your marriage license, and I will do it in full Gandalf mm -hmm. regalia if you want me to. And you know he can talk the talk I... while he's in that Gandalf costume. I mean, come on. Fool of a took. Yes. Throw yourself in next time and rid us of your stupidity. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. So yeah, I mean, this is um, this is a really good time to be a Tolkien fan because we have. Brand new Tolkien books that have just come out, and it's like maybe the last time we'll ever get a brand new Tolkien book. It's a surprise to me. I would think that they would have tapped. There was more. That well, a long time ago. Professor Tolkien left behind oceans of manuscripts that That's were right. scribbled on. He would half written notes. You know, thanks. Well, no, you should see me when I'm sober. Haha. <laughs> I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, she says nice Gandalf impersonation. No. Do not take me for a fool. Oh, how can we can we scroll down like yeah? Do not um, take me for a conjurer of cheap tricks, Bilbo Baggins. Jane said, "Whoa, whoa! I don't know what I did." Hey, Done. that's okay. Uh, what did I do? You didn't I do was anything. Touching things, I don't understand. In Instagram only has a sixty-minute time limit, oh. and we just met that because it's six ten. Okay. We started at five ten. Somebody put up a comment about about uh, the Fingal marrying up that I wanted to read. Oh, Repeat well. that. You know what? Hey, yes, I know there was someone... You just put up a comment about... Yes. You just put up a comment on this live stream about Fingal marrying up. I was about to read it. I missed it, so go ahead and put it again. You can cut and want. paste. You can copy and paste, my friends. So, oh, Jean Bourgeois, you're very sweet. You are very sweet. Now, oh yeah, hi, Thorin's wife. Hello, Thorin's wife. Are you in the live chat, too? It's good to have you on board. Now we got a welcome back Instagram. We apolo we apologize because it always happens. Mm. There's always a 60 minute time limit, and it looks like we're coming down to the last 20 minutes of our show. No. Have you got? Um, I was having a big conversation with some people who had not seen the Star Wars movies last night. Literally having this conversation like about any of them? None, none. Huh. And whenever you come into a conversation with a, a newbie who's never seen Star Wars movies, you immediately want to ask. How are you going to show them the movies? Are you going to introduce them in the release order? Because they were released from the 70s and the 80s. Well, and do rule those one, first. don't watch the prequels. And do the prequels. No, wait, just, no. Just there's, don't. There's a lot of conventional wisdom. Just don't waste your time. 
Well, there's the machete order, um, which does... I've heard of this, the machete cut, which apparently cuts all the garbage out of the prequels and makes a very watchable set of films. The well, first one ends up being like half an hour long. Actually, in the, um, the, the, the machete order isn't a re-edit. It's just a chosen order of watching them. And you eradicate mm. the Phantom Menace and don't watch it at all. But in the mm. machete order, you begin with Luke's story. And you tell A New Hope, mm. and then you tell... The um the Empire Strikes Back and you establish and then all when of it Luke's gets to story. the I am your father it like flashes back to yes and then to you us seeing what's his name playing Anakin, Anakin Skywalker and you do Anakin's story yeah. but you only do Episode two and three and you skip the Phantom Menace and the mm-hmm. reason why is because all that family drama is hanging in the air it's important to watch the prequels only for the origin story of Ewan McGregor and that's all but you can skip Episode one the Phantom Menace yeah. but anyways the, the machete order is most interesting because Han is frozen in carbonite. Luke has discovered his ancestry, and at the end of The Empire Strikes Back, when you're going to go and leave the audience member hanging there, and remember, they've never seen these films. In this hypothetical, the person you're showing them to has never seen them. Hey, welcome, Germany. So, if you go and do the flashback and do Anakin's story with Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, then you understand everything that happened to make him Darth Vader, and you flash forward again, and you resolve the story of the father and the story of the son resolved together and it makes the conversations between Luke and Leia so interesting because Luke is like what do you remember of your past when you were just a child and and she looks at him and she's like what's wrong what's going on and he's like I'll tell you later and there's all this stuff hanging in the air it makes it very interesting but about the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings I want to bring this question forward if you are showing a newbie a brand new newbie who's never seen Hobbit or Lord of the Rings in what in what order do you show them the six films? What do you think? Oh. Yes, you think? yes, okay. Because um, I know my opinion already. I've talked about it for months. That's a tough one. If it were the books, I would always I, say to start with The Hobbit. I agree with you, Umaric. Oh, you definitely need to you watch... Are tr- from Umaric the Hunter. I agree you with are that. A tr- if you're a true fan, you would have sat through all eight seasons of Clone Wars and three of the Star Wars Rebels. <laughs> That's funny. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, now, here, Mr. Mr. S- oh, going fast. Mr. S.J. Dean says Lord of the Rings first for sure, okay. and that is actually what I was going to say. You say Lord of the Rings first, With and the then books, Hobbit? if you're reading the books, Hobbit first always. Yes. But I think for the movies, start with the Lord of the Rings, and then see how you feel about if you want to continue with The Hobbit. I think The Hobbit films have great stuff in them. And mm. I know that there are... There is, by now, like a fan edit of all three movies that there makes many. it so that it's just the book. There's uh, at least half a dozen fan edits, I'm sure which there are, are multiples, huge. and I don't want to have yes. to weed through... I would really like to see an edited version of the three Hobbit films that is a very good, professionally done edit that's just the actual book. Yep. If anybody out there knows the best one that they would like to recommend to me, please put it in one of these message boards because I'd love to check that out. We have talked about this on the show before. The dwarf edit is a really popular one. Dwarf edit? The dwarf okay. edit. It, and if, if I can I can YouTube it, that, just yep. put in The, the Hobbit, Hobbit dwarf, the dwarf edit, edit, and it'll yep. come right up. You can up. find that okay, out. Cool. Yeah, you can find That's a very good one. You want to find the one that takes out most of the Tauriel and Legolas stuff because a lot of these fan edits take all that stuff out and just focus on what Bilbo and what Thorin and company are doing. And for Umarak the Hunter, I understand exactly what you mean. You've been through this and you've shown The Hobbit first and other people are like, I agree with Ben, agree with Ben, Lord of the Rings first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, hey guys, here's a counterpoint to that argument. If you want to introduce someone to The Hobbit first, Instead of the Lord of the Rings first, the main benefit is this guy. You get to see Christopher Lee as a good guy. You get to understand the nature of relationships between Galadriel, Saruman, Gandalf, and Elrond. The reason why I'm most interested in this is because in the opening of the Fellowship of the Ring, Saruman and his turning, his turning to become a traitor, it takes bare minutes. It happens in only a couple of minutes in the film. Mm -hmm. And there's no context about why the gravity of that is so huge. If you watch the Hobbit films first, you're going to get all that context and you will really understand a a, a much clearer view of what's at stake for Gandalf going up to Saruman to get advice and then getting beaten up and then imprisoned at the top of Orthanc, the Tower of Orthanc. That's just my opinion. And no matter what order you decide to watch them in, make sure you watch the 
the extended cuts of the Hobbit films because there are scenes That's right, with TNA. Saruman. Yes, start with the extended edition of the Hobbit. There you go. Mm -hmm. Only watch the extended cuts. I I did see some of them in the theater and then rewatch them with this guy with the extended cut. Yep. And parts that were cut out, I mean, I understand you're putting a movie in the theater, it can't be three and a half hours long. I, I get it, but there were things that were cut out that were so essential and uh, for instance the battle of the five armies i first watched it at his place extended cut and i have no interest in watching the theatrical version because he was telling me the parts that were cut out of it i would not want to see the movie without those parts yeah. so whatever order you do it in make sure you see the extended cut and you can get the cool backstory with saruman it really does it really does enrich things it's not just like bells and whistles thrown on that they cut out. Indeed. Absolutely yeah. agreed. Always. The extended cut of Desolation of Smaug is such a significantly different film. Jean Bourgeois in our Facebook chat says, speaking of introducing noobs, I got a friend who wants to try getting into Tolkien, but I'm not sure entirely how to start. He tried watching An Unexpected Journey, A-U-J, but he couldn't get very far. He has attention deficit disorder, and was it was very complicated for him. He's willing to try again. My advice, Jean Bourgeois, let your friend start with the 1977 animated Rankin and Bass, The Hobbit. Because... Oh, yes. That movie still still holds up. It's, it holds yeah. up so good, and it's only 96 minutes long. So try that. And it nails the book. It nails I the book it, I think perfectly. It, really yeah. it nails also, the book so perfectly. I also have ADD, uh, for whatever that means. There's... Mm -hmm. A lot of controversy about the existence of that. Um, mm, yes. Honestly, I mean, how, how old is was it? Did he say his cousin? His what was the relation of the person he tried to show? The noob? A friend? A Jean, friend? Jean Bourgeois just says trying to show a friend. I would recommend starting how old, with. How old was your friend? Maybe age had something to do with it. Those movies yes. are dense. They are they are long. I mean, at any age, you might have yes. trouble sitting through the whole thing. Scott Weir says I've noticed that younger generations of kids like the Hobbit films better than the Lord of the Rings don't know anyone who saw Lord of the Rings first thinks that the Hobbit films are better. Also true. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be an ongoing earmark or watermark that differentiates us as a generation. I'm a generation of fans which uh, I'm so hooked on the original psychedelic 1970s Ralph Bakshi. As messy as it was, I love that stuff. I really love that stuff. Even though it was oh, messy. And, uh, but Jean I don't like the animated... Jean you know, Bourgeois says he's 34. He's 34. That is well, my age. You, hey, really? Wow, yes. I thought you were 24. Oh, well, I'm so flattered. Wow. Um, but, he's got yes. a magic portrait up in his attic absorbing his <laughs> age. Okay, um, Mar yeah. Mardi Gras W says, Will Peter make another Tolkien movie? No. Is he burnt out? I hope not. Yes. Peter and Jackson so. has said he's burnt <laughs> out. And he said he's going to step aside. Well, he didn't want to make the first Hobbit movie. He, he, like, he, he wanted to step he, aside. Yes, He had true. a great idea that I'm going to produce this and Guillermo del Toro is going to be in charge because he knew that Guillermo was the right guy for the job. And the things that were out of Peter Jackson's control made that not possible. True. And it really sucks because Peter Jackson had the right vision. And his vision was that he should not be the director. Guillermo del Toro should be the director, he should be the production designer, and Peter Jackson's just going to, you know, be in charge of things as a producer. As a big, as an that executive was, producer. Yeah, as yes. an executive producer, and that was a great idea, that is exactly what should have happened, things should have gone Peter's way on this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unfortunate that we didn't get the incredible vision that Guillermo del Toro would have, would have given us. Add, to add more shit onto that level of shame, we are not even going to get Hellboy 3. Oh, we aren't? From Guillermo del Toro. Oh. A month and a half ago, Universal Studios said we're canceling any involvement and we're canceling Hellboy 3. Because they had to make the wonderful Mummy movie with starring Tom Cruise. That was <laughs> way more important. And guess what? Guess what else happened? <laughs> a few weeks after Universal Studios said we're not going to let Guillermo del Toro finish his Hellboy trilogy, do you know what they said? They're going to reboot the whole damn thing. What? A month later... And they're rebooting it with different directors, different actors, different people. And the sheriff from Stranger Things is going to be the new Hellboy, replacing Ron Perlman. That's not a bad casting decision. No, it's a great casting decision. But, but why even, why, why throw the baby out with the bathwater? Well, I have some mixed feelings on Guillermo. 
Um, this is, I guess this is on topic because this is a Tolkien <laughs> it's, podcast. Look, anything discussing Del Toro is Hobbit. on point. It is on point. It's on point. Um, Guillermo Del Toro can't do anything but make luscious production design anymore. His movies are absolute shit. Did anybody see Crimson Peak? That movie is I a did. mess. I it's saw Crimson Peak. It looks so beautiful. Mm-hmm. It is gorgeous. The costumes are gorgeous. The the ghosts are gorgeous. Everything about it is yeah. beautiful production design. Yeah. Same with but Pacific you didn't care Rim. care for the script? Beautiful production design all around. I mean, and Pacific Rim, you can't complain as much because it's a movie about giant monsters fighting giant robots. Kaiju and, robots. And that's what you get, and that's great. I very much enjoyed well, it. Crimson Peak is... Mess. <laughs> F- we don't often it get f bombs on our show. We're sorry awful. about that, but that's the only way to describe it. <laughs> you can go. I'll go ahead and like argue about that, but it is. So you mean watch it again you, if you doubt me. You and mean, here we have um, oh, a little comment. Del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth was freaking phenomenal, and it absolutely was. And that's why Crimson Peak and Pacific Rim pissed me off so much because, is because you, we know that he is capable of something you, that is wait, no. absolutely you, beautiful you, on every level from not, script to screen. Not even great directors of the past like Preston Sturgis, uh, Otto Preminger, or John Huston were able to get lightning in the bottle every single time they made a film. Oh, of course not. I mean, but you can't always get the African queen no. as a director and get this perfect film. With and this, I'm not asking you, him to, you, but, you know, but this is a man who I know has competent script writing ability. I know that he can make a good story that makes yes. sense and have motivations work yes. out and yes. and things that happen pay off properly on a on a basic like script yes. writing level. True, true. And watching Crimson Peak, I was just very confused as to how this like clearly he just didn't care and he wanted to make a gothic love story and he wanted he he was all about his production design. Yes. Which was I'd, Flawless. He crushed it. He I, always crushes the production design. I do not have such severe complaints about Crimson Peak. I really don't. It was a mess. I, I grew up forced. I was I was in advanced placement English. Sorry. Yeah. I hate to do that, but I was in AP classes yeah, so was I. for English literature and world literature. And when it came time for us to like stick it out with The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy and all those gothic romance books by the the Bronte sisters and the whole the whole Wuthering Heights, Jane Eyre kind of routine. By the time I got into watching Crimson Peak, I swear to God, I thought that I was in a remake of There's Eustacia Vi, this amazing femme fatale from Thomas Hardy's, you know, The Return of the Native. I thought that I was really in a, a recreation of one of those gothic romance books, and I kind of liked it. I liked where I was. I don't have those severe complaints against Crimson Peak. I have to admit, I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff, but whatever. Uh, I know, look, Umarek the Hunter's like the Bronte is so boring. I know, when you read, when you read Return of the Native or uh, Wuthering Heights or Jane Eyre, it is a slog. It's a terrifying slog to get through. Kind of like reading the Silmarillion. It's a slog, I'm telling you. But when you get there, there are rewards. There are rewards mm-hmm. at that level of storytelling. We have a question that's just me. from Life with Zia. Cliff and Ben, what do you think about characters and scenes who haven't been in the books? Oh, you mean like Tario? Yeah, you know? There's a lot of extra stuff in the movies that Peter Jackson took great liberties with. Because, you know, he yeah. was, it was his movie and it wasn't necessarily something that happened in the book. I find it ironic that they took so many liberties with The Hobbit when in The Lord of the Rings they took such effort to be close to the book. There wasn't an effort to depart. The only thing that really pissed us off with The Lord of the Rings was when Faramir captures Sam and Frodo and drags them against their will all the way back to the river, back to Osgiliath. And that shit never happened. That never happened to the books. But... I mean, that's a small price to pay for all the other great stuff we got in Lord of the Rings. But you know what? Seriously, there's a lot of stuff in The Hobbit which was just added and added and added. And the movie goes from being a 96-minute animated cartoon to three movies at three hours each. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what does that tell you? you could what does that tell you? a detailed, accurate film of the book The Hobbit yeah. at two hours. Yeah, you could get every mm-hmm. single page into that into that movie. Absolutely, you might, you might indeed. And yeah, 
Well, and, all know, right. And Guillermo, like going back to Peter Jackson having the right idea okay. to start, Guillermo knew that he was just going to do two, right? Mm-hmm. That would have been great. And that also would have been stretching it out a bit, but I'm sure it would have been stretched out in a good way. I, I like the extra stuff that I got at a certain level. For example, mm-hmm. more of, you know, Stephen Fry as the master of Lake Town, because Stephen Fry is awesome, and the more of him, the better. Even when he's gross and disgusting and looks gross, because Stephen Fry is a wonderful character actor. Um, I like having more Legolas. It's always great to have that bit in the film where Legolas is looking at uh, that pocket uh, picture uh, that he's got glowing. He's captured glowing in the woods, and he says, who is this ugly creature? And he's like, that's my wife. (laughs) And he looks at the other picture and says, and this other little orc? And he's like, that's my wee son, Gimli. You know, (laughs) I... I love that stuff because, you know, uh, Peter Hamilton managed to bring something to glowing, which I saw a lot of John Rhys-Davies in what he was doing. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. And and to hear glowing say, that's my wee lad Gimli, and Legolas sneers at the picture, not knowing that in future movies, Gimli is going to be his closest friend. I kind of dig all that stuff that The Hobbit. Yes, those was, are fun little nods they were to us Lord of the Rings stuff. films. I'm I'm okay with, a lot of stuff. with things like that because they they feel organic. Now, because it, it's something that's playing off something else that has been established in the movie universe. Ultimately, it would have been weird if Legolas did not show up in any Hobbit films at all. It kind of would have been weird. Do you know what I mean? Even though everyone says Legolas did not exist in the Hobbit books, why did you stick him in there? But. I, you know, I kind of liked having Orlando Bloom. Because we got to get three movies out of this, people. <laughs> we need to throw in some more characters. That's these, why. Yes, these things. These things have been. Yeah. You're right, Umarak. These things have been said many, many, many times in previous conversations about the Hobbit films. But uh, back to our original conversation, in showing Star Wars to a total noob who's never ever seen them, you have the advantage. You have the luxury of being able to switch films around. You can watch them in any order you want. But in the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings universe, I think the six Middle Earth films benefit by starting with The Hobbit and going on till you get to the end. And here's another reason why. The Hobbit is running at about seven out of 10, maybe. Maybe The Hobbit is running at eight out of 10 on a full scale. While the Lord of the Rings movies are at 10 out of 10 every single time. And you're not going to get someone to appreciate The Hobbit after they've been through the sturm and drang and the ultimate catharsis of The Lord of the Rings. And then they're not going to be able to go from that marked level of 10 and go down to a 7 on storytelling. They're just not going to be able to do that and enjoy The Hobbit for what it's really offering. So I recommend start small, start small with The Hobbit and then work your way up. But I could see going back to what someone in the chat room up there said, uh, Jean Bourgeois. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yes, well, we, we kind of do. Yeah. The, We're great. Yeah, are we great? Yeah. Are we good? Is it 6.30? Oh, oh, does that... All right, let's fi- all let's right. finish our We're chat. We're going to wrap it up. Back oh to what, what Jean Bourgeois was saying, that his <laughs> 34-year-old friend my age um, had trouble g- just getting through it, that that is arduous to start with those Hobbit films. Fair enough. Three two-plus-hour movies. Yep. And then get into Lord of the Rings. It's just so much. I feel like the best thing to do would be to well, like take breaks. The very first. Don't try and marathon any of that. There, I had a crazy idea, Jean Bourgeois. What do you think? Yeah. Go back to the Rankin and Bass animated film and let your friend watch that ninety-six minute film. Yeah, yeah. I would say start that. with that. And For if, a noob, start yeah. with the Rankin and Bass Hobbit. And Absolutely. if they if they really dig it, if they really like it, then you can go and give them that copy of An Unexpected Journey and have them start right at the riddle game, at the very end of the film, so they can see the Mm. big final third act where they're escaping from the goblins and uh, the Bilbo and the dwarves have to escape with Azog coming to get them and the eagles, the grand rescue of the eagles at the end of the film. You might show them that, and if they really like the animated world, and if they can get in touch with that version of Gollum and that performance of Martin Freeman and Andy Serkis, and if they can get into it going forward, then they might like the rest of the live-action films a bit better. Uh, wait, hold on, there's Pete. Hey, North Ronner, it's so good to see you. Uh, one of our wonderful uh, original audience crew who's been with us for all these years. It's so good to see you there. Um, 
Although I do watch Battle of the Five Armies Extended Edition, it seems that Jackson was able to take his time and put more care into that film than in An Unexpected Journey and Desolation of Smaug. Maybe so. Yeah, Pete. I think that I think that Peter did have more time to put more thoughtfulness into the battles and all that stuff. But, you know, nobody's going to wander into the Lord of the Rings and feel the same way about The Hobbit afterwards. It's just mm. it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Uh, but I'm so like excited to be talking to Ben, talking about our favorite subjects. Um, I feel like you could just go to the LOTR movies. See, Ty Dyed Kid says, like you said, yeah. start someone with the Lord of the Rings movies. Hmm. You know what? Uh, There's yeah. a lot of differing opinions on this, but let's get back to Star Wars for one second. I love the Machete Order, and whenever I bring a newbie into Star Wars, we start with four, A New Hope, and then five, The Empire Strikes Back, then we flash back and do Attack of the Clones, then we do Revenge of the Sith, and then we flash forward again and do Return of the Jedi. That's how we do it. Uh, I love you guys. Last You're a question. great audience. Is it true, Vigo said no to The Hobbit because Aragorn is not in the story. Aragorn? Arag uh, he spelled it Aragorn. Aragorn? Hey, you know what? It should be Aragorn. That is, that is a question never heard from of that. TNA.O. Sorry, I, TNA? It could just be a fan rumor. We, we have no idea. I've never heard of that rumor. And why would Viggo Mortensen want anything to do with The Hobbit if Aragorn is not in it? You know, the only version of an Aragorn who might be there might be 12 years old. And we, we did speculate that there'd be a young, very young Aragorn, mm -hmm. you know, like, he was like, he might have been 15 or 16 years old at the time of The Hobbit. Looking at the time frame, I better check that. But uh, you know what? You guys are really awesome. Uh, just to say, I love you guys. You are constantly here with us. And I appreciate you. As a beautiful audience, you are a thoughtful, intelligence, intelligent audience, and you guys always bring it. With every week, our show continues to be really engaging and really fun because you guys bring it. You yes. bring it. And now I will go back under the table where I live. Oh, the Bye. question is, oh, are you leaving? Are you going under the table? Well, the show's over, right? Yeah, show's over. Okay. Okay, so he's... Should I stay for one more question? One more question. Um, you were saying, I mean, do we even want to see an Aragorn that's not played by Vigo? You know what? That's a good question. You know what? If they... I'll come back up for this. Come, we, th we've got to finish the show. But mm -hmm. let me tell you, I have a prediction that, you know, Lee Pace as Thranduil said, said to Legolas at the end of the film... You need to go out there and you need to meet this guy. His name is Strider. I won't tell you what his real name is. You'll find that out for yourself. But you should go and meet Strider. And that is how Legolas and Thranduil part ways at the end of the third Hobbit film. Which led me to believe that Warner Brothers is going to roll up their sleeves and they're going to give us a, a buddy movie. Like a young Legolas and a young Aragorn buddy movie where they first meet each other and go mm. chasing after Gollum and having the hunt for Gollum going across Wilderland. And do you know what? If that ever happens, they're going to recast Legolas and Aragorn. They will. That's right. They will. They'll have to. They'll have to. It's just going to have to be done. What do you think? Crazy idea? I don't know if that sounds very viable. It, the, the story is in the appendix in the back of The Return of the King. There's a lot of story there. And well, I'm, they I'm have, not they saying have the story they have a license be there. To yeah. I'm saying it being a monetarily successful movie. I don't know if that's there. The Hunt and for Gollum? That is all that the studio actually cares about. I'm just talking about the reality of that movie happening. Yeah, maybe. Uh, people who, who sign the hundred plus million dollar checks need to believe they're going to make a profit off of that. Well, I don't know if they're going to have the vision to see something like that. Deep in the world of fan films, the most successful fan film ever made and has never been taken down by copyright holders because they support it it's not making any money. It's available for free. You can watch it online. It's called The Hunt for Gollum. Oh. And it is about, you know, Gandalf and Aragorn tracking down Gollum in that time not when... Legolas and Aragorn. I think... Oh, I, you know what? I, really, I think Legolas might be in there. I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to... I'd have, have to, to go back this. and find it. Yeah, and so I need to watch the dwarf cut of The Hobbit? The dwarf apparently? cut? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The dwarf cut of The Hobbit. Guys, hello Brazil. Good night, Brazil. I would love... D.L. Penley says, I would love an after the Third Age story. What happened to all the characters afterward? Hmm. Well, you can find a lot of those details in the appendix at the back of The Return of the King. There's some stuff in there. Um, you know what, guys? I gotta close. I hate to say goodnight, but, you know, so long, farewell, auf Wiedersehen, goodnight, adieu.
Back uh, under the table where I live. He's gonna go down under the table where all the mushrooms and the fungus grow under the roots of the trees. <laughs> get down, get down, and, okay. He's hiding, he's hiding under the epidermis of Middle Earth, under the soil, under the dirt. Then don't say goodnight, we have to say goodnight. You guys are an awesome audience. Love you guys very, very, very much. Uh, how about the appendices? Yeah, you wanna get more ideas for what future Middle Earth stories might look like in television and film? Then you should take a look at the appendices at the back of The Return of the King, because it's the only stuff that they have licensed. It's the only material currently that can be licensed. What should I do? Do a little more Gandalf? I will not say all tears are an evil. No, what is the, what's the quote? I messed it up. He says, I will not say do not weep, for not all tears are an evil. And of course, everybody in the audience is going, ah, they're crying and they're crying. Oh my God, there's evil undead arms reaching out from under the ground, trying to get me. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Um, good night, everyone. And always remember, always remember, always remember, when your heart wants lifting, think of pleasant things. That is a quote from the Rankin-Bass animated The Hobbit. Not the live action, but that's a Gandalf quote from the Rankin-Bass animated The Hobbit.